Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. Another attack in Pakistan, this time on the Gwadar port. Bomb blasts and a gunfight. Baloch militants went after Chinese investments there yet again. We'll bring you the details and discuss why China should cut its losses and exit Gwadar. Meanwhile, in India, it's election season and Prime Minister Modi has two invitations from Ukraine and Russia. What do they want? Can and should India broker peace in this war? We'll discuss that. In Vietnam, they'll name the third president in one year. Thanks to a massive corruption crackdown, will this political churn hurt Vietnam's economy and investments? India is looking to ramp up deep sea mining to power its green transition. We'll tell you how. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni has declared war on deep fakes. She's gone to court after her own images were used for pornographic content. In Argentina, is the president's shock therapy helping the economy? We'll bring you the numbers. In Senegal, elections after much chaos, uncertainty and delays. MS Dhoni steps down as CSK captain. We'll look at the story and the brand. And a man playing chess with a Neuralink brain chip. How does it work? Is this the future? Also, why is Macron going viral for his biceps? Yes, we're talking about the French president. All of that coming up ahead. The headlines first. The U.S. urges immediate ceasefire in Gaza at the United Nations, circulates a draft resolution. This is the first time Washington has done so since the Israel-Hamas war began. Earlier, the U.S. had blocked all drafts using the word immediate. This change, this change in stance, comes amid fears of a famine in Gaza. Just weeks ahead of election in India, Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has been arrested. The Enforcement Directorate arrests him in the liquor policy case. The central agency says Kejriwal was a quote-unquote conspirator in the graft case. This is the first time in India's history that a sitting chief minister has been arrested. In India, the opposition Congress party says it has no cash for election campaigning. In February, the income tax department froze many of the party's bank accounts. Rahul Gandhi says the party has no money to support its candidates, says it's an assault on democracy. Indonesia's opposition candidate calls for a fresh vote after his election loss. Anis Baswedan challenges Prabowo Subianto's victory at the presidential poll. He claims rules were unfairly changed to allow the outgoing president, Joko Widodo's son, to run as vice president. Switzerland becomes the first developed economy to cut interest rates. It was a surprise move by the Swiss National Bank. The rate cut by a quarter points is the first since June 2022. The SNB said inflation is likely to stay below 2% for the foreseeable future. And taps run dry in Johannesburg as South Africa's largest city faces an unprecedented water crisis. Around 6 million people live in Johannesburg. Intense heat and a crumbling water infrastructure are being blamed for this crisis. Let me start with a question. Should China consider moving out of Gwadar? In fact, I can think of a lot of places that China should get out of. But tonight, we will focus on Gwadar, the port that they've built in Pakistan. Should China abandon it? That's our question. It may sound extreme. It's probably the last thing that China wants to do. But they should seriously consider it, especially after yesterday's events. The Gwadar port came under attack yet again. The attackers were the BLA, the Baloch Liberation Army, a group that has been fighting the Pakistani military for years now. And they have a clear mission now, driving China out of Gwadar. The BLA is now ramping up its efforts. Eight of its members launched an attack yesterday, and they came well prepared, armed with guns and bombs. And they chose an important target, a complex right outside the port. This complex has several offices. All top officials related to the port sit here in this complex, including officials from the Pakistan government. Their intelligence agencies, their paramilitary forces, all of them are stationed here. And these are all high-value targets, which is why this complex came under attack. It began with multiple bomb blasts. Then there was shooting. A gunfight followed. 
Pakistan's military gunned down all eight militants. Not without casualties, though. Two soldiers were killed in action. But Pakistan's loss was much greater than this. What was also damaged was the military's reputation. As a security provider to CPEC, CPEC is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, Pakistan's army is supposed to secure it, supposed to secure its assets. But they failed. They did not see this attack coming. They looked unprepared. And it took them some two hours to neutralize the militants. And remember, this is supposed to be a high security zone. Many Chinese nationals work in Gwadar and Pakistan created a special security force just to protect them. And this force has at least 15,000 troops. They have checkpoints everywhere. According to one local politician, there are more checkpoints than CPEC projects in Gwadar. In fact, I have his quote with me. There is no CPEC in Gwadar except security checkposts that exist in the name of CPEC in Gwadar. If you ask me, CPEC projects in Gwadar are the name of security checkposts. That should tell you something. Numerous checkposts, 15,000 troops, and they could not stop eight militants. They not only reached the Gwadar port, they also detonated bombs. And this was not a first. Last year, a convoy was attacked in Gwadar. It had 23 Chinese engineers. They had a narrow escape thanks to their bulletproof vehicles. But you see the larger problem here. A constant threat looms, and you cannot bulletproof everything and everyone. Plus, experts fear that Gwadar will see more attacks. So the question is, can Pakistan thwart the next attack? And this is a question that the Chinese should be asking. Because the Pakistani army is losing ground and losing face. Over the weekend, they were attacked by the TTP too. The Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan, TTP, also known as the Pakistani Taliban. A check post along the Afghanistan border was targeted. And we told you about it on the show. And the Afghan border has become quite volatile. The Taliban in Kabul have turned against Pakistan. They're protecting the Pakistani Taliban, giving it a safe haven in Afghanistan from where they launch attacks. Islamabad has failed to stop it. They even went to the United Nations to complain. No luck. So the Pakistani army is now stretched thin. They've opened way too many fronts. They've exchanged fire with Iran. They have constant skirmishes with Afghanistan. And now attacks in Balochistan. How can they safeguard Chinese assets? For the moment, China sounds supportive. We have noticed relevant reports. We strongly condemn this terrorist attack and express our grief for Pakistani personnel who sacrificed their lives in the attack. China opposes all forms of terrorism, firmly supports Pakistan's national development and social stability, and firmly supports Pakistan's fight against terrorism and maintenance of its national security and stability. China opposes all forms of terrorism and firmly supports Pakistan. This sentence makes no sense. But that's what the Chinese said. Although their patience may run out soon, they've put way too much money in CPEC. And for the project to deliver, safety and security are prerequisites. But Pakistan has repeatedly failed to ensure that. There was a time when China had called Gwadar the crown jewel of CPEC. But now it's a thorn, a hotbed of rebellion against Chinese investments in Pakistan. Our next story is about the war in Ukraine. Two years and counting, how and when will this war end? Can India be the peace broker? We ask because Ukraine is having a big change of heart. It is reaching out to India. After all the criticism, all the emotional outbursts, Kiev now wants India's help. On Wednesday, President Zelensky spoke to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The Prime Minister agreed to support all peace efforts. He also promised more humanitarian aid. Zelensky, though, had a lot more to say. He invited India to the Switzerland Peace Summit. It's all the hype now. Switzerland is hosting a special summit for Ukraine. We do not have a date yet. But it could happen this summer. And who's invited? On paper, everyone is invited. Switzerland has asked all United Nations members to attend this summit. But let's face it, not everyone will attend. So Zelensky reached out to India. He says it's important that New Delhi attends this summit. And it's clear why. India has very close relations with Russia. So Zelensky is hoping that India will use that influence, maybe nudge Russia towards a ceasefire. But here's a bigger question. Will Russia attend the talks in Switzerland? 
All indications are that they will not. For starters, Moscow doesn't like what's on the table. The Swiss summit is built around Zelensky's peace plan. And that involves a Russian withdrawal. It's a non-starter for Putin. Secondly, Moscow does not like the host. Their foreign minister says he does not rely on Swiss services. He says Switzerland is not neutral anymore. And that's a problem. So what's the point of having a peace summit without Russia? You can imagine how it will go. All Western allies will sit at a table, they will pat each other on the back, agree to support Ukraine, criticize Russia, and job done. But what will it change on the ground? Absolutely nothing. And Ukraine knows this. They've seen how Western support is weakening, how military aid is drying up, and at the same time, how Russia is stepping up things. Vladimir Putin has just won an election. He's starting his new term with more attacks. On Thursday, Russia fired a barrage of missiles at Kiev. It was the largest attack in weeks. Around 17 people were injured. Many buildings and industrial facilities were hit. Another attack was on Kharkiv. Zelensky announced that five people had been killed there. You could sense some helplessness in his tone. Necessary aid is being provided to every injured person, but this is not enough. Everyone must realize this. Kharkiv needs an adequate number of air defense systems. Sumi region needs it. Chernihiv region and all our other regions suffering from Russian terror need it. So the tide is clearly turning, which is why Zelensky is exploring alternatives. It is a big climb down, though, because not very long ago, Ukraine was quite upset with India. You may remember what the foreign minister said in 2022. In fact, let me quote what he said. When India purchases Russian crude oil at a discount, they have to understand that the discount has, has to be paid by Ukrainian blood. Every barrel of Russian crude that India gets has a good portion of Ukrainian blood in it. That was Dmitry Kuleba in 2022, Ukraine's foreign minister. And their position was not too bad then, in 2022. A successful Ukrainian counter-offensive was in the works. The sanctions on Russia were piling up, so Kiev was a bit bolder then. But now it's very different. Some $60 billion of aid is stuck in the U.S. Congress. European nations are battling a financial decline. So guess what this very same foreign minister is now doing? He's traveling to India. Again, we do not have a date yet, but reports say he'll arrive later this month. And this is big. India has not hosted top Ukrainian officials since the war began. So if Kuleba comes, it will be a first. And his agenda is quite clear, to lobby for India's support in the peace talks, to see if India can play peacemaker. But will New Delhi play along? More importantly, should India wade into this war? India's position has been clear and consistent. Prime Minister Modi has said that this is not the era for war. At the same time, India has refused to gang up with the West against Russia. Before speaking to Zelensky, Modi also, Modi also spoke to Putin. He congratulated him on his re-election. He promised to strengthen relations and got an invitation to visit Russia. So Prime Minister Modi has an open invite to both Ukraine and Russia. How many leaders can say that? A handful at most. So New Delhi is well placed to mediate a settlement and it has the chops. Just a few months ago at the G20, India overcame differences over Ukraine to get a joint statement. So India can engage in quiet, constructive diplomacy. Unlike some in the West who are given to high decibel jet setting mediation efforts, India can play a role. But India must read the room first to see how sincere all sides are, especially Ukraine. They are on the back foot and in no position to dictate the outcome. Russia has spent millions of dollars and lost hundreds of soldiers in this war. They finally seem to have an upper hand. So you cannot expect Putin to just withdraw and seize fire. Zelensky will have to make concessions. If not, these trips and appeals to India are pointless. Now let's look at Vietnam. The Southeast Asian nation is facing a crackdown an internal crackdown on rampant corruption. And the latest headline from Vietnam is this. Another president has been purged, President Vo Van Thuong. He resigned today. Vietnam's ruling Communist Party put out a statement. And this is what they said. Vo Van Thuong's violations and flaws have negatively affected public perception as well as the reputation of the party and the state. 
They did not specify the violations, but the message was quite clear. The president was linked with corruption, so he had to go. And with this, Thuong has become Vietnam's shortest serving president. He had taken office only in March last year. I, President of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, swear to be absolutely loyal to the nation, to the people, and the constitution of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. It seems he wasn't loyal enough, or at least his reputation was not clean enough. He is now Vietnam's second president to resign due to corruption in just one year. His predecessor was also forced to resign, again because of corruption allegations, and this was last January. Two deputy prime ministers were also sacked that month. So it seems no one is above the law in Vietnam. No one is safe from the anti-corruption drive, which, by the way, is called the Blazing Furnace. It's an intimidating name, and it seems quite accurate. Since 2016, the Blazing Furnace has burnt almost 200,000 officials, 2 lakh officials. This is across all levels of government. Thousands of them have been forced to resign. A number of them are in jail, including a former health minister. He's serving an 18-year sentence. He was convicted for taking bribes from a COVID-19 test supplier. Now, all this sounds commendable. It shows that Vietnam has a no-nonsense approach to corruption, and that is inspiring. But the sheer magnitude of this crackdown also raises questions. Like, why is corruption so widespread in the country in the first place? How are people at every level corrupt, including multiple presidents? To understand this, we need to take a closer look at Vietnam's political system. Vietnam is a communist country. They have one political party, and that is the Communist Party of Vietnam. The president is not the most powerful figure in the country, nor is the prime minister. The most powerful person is the Communist Party's general secretary. This man... Gwen Phu Trong. He's been General Secretary since 2011, 2011, and it is under him that Vietnam's anti-corruption drive has taken place. He wanted the war on corruption to be his legacy. This General Secretary is 79 years old, which means he may retire soon. This is not the United States after all. Old people retire here. The Vietnamese government's term ends in 2026, and General Secretary Trong is widely expected to step down. The president usually becomes the next general secretary. And this was supposed to be President Thuong, the one who was sacked today. He was considered the secretary general's protege and the chosen successor. But then an old corruption case came up. A 12-year-old bribery charge from the president's time as a regional level party worker, which raises more uncomfortable questions. Was the cold case revived for political purposes? Is Vietnam's corruption drive being used to settle political scores? Whatever the case, the blazing furnace has set fire to Vietnam's stability. The public is angry at all the corruption they see. Government officials are not letting projects proceed. They're dragging their feet on approvals, afraid of being implicated in possible corruption scandals. And this has also made investors wary about their projects hitting a roadblock. All this has led to a slowdown in growth. And remember, Vietnam has been an Asian success story this century. It has grown by leaps and bounds since the early 2000s, taking full advantage of the world's growing wariness of China. But corruption is the flip side of that coin. Unchecked growth does lead to widespread corruption. Vietnam may need to find a balance now or risk losing out on the next economic boom. Now, you've heard of the space race, you've heard of the nuclear race. Let me now introduce the deep sea race, a race to the bottom of the ocean. To find what? Resources. Scientists say it's a treasure trove down there. Guess how much these resources are worth? Between 8 and 16 trillion dollars. 8 and 16 trillion dollars, so India is joining this race. It wants to mine the deep sea for resources. And how do you do that? Well, first you need permission, a license to explore the seabed. This license is given by a United Nations body. It's called the ISA, the International Seabed Authority, ISA. You can apply for permission to explore the seabed of a particular area. If the ISA agrees, you can go ahead. Now, so far, 31 licenses have been issued. Two of them belong to India. 
They were issued back in 2016. But now India wants at least two more, two more licenses. One to explore the Indian Ocean's Carlsberg Ridge and the second to explore a sea mount, again in the Indian Ocean. Reports say the ISA's legal team has sent some questions to India. If they're satisfied, New Delhi could get the license. So that's permission check. The second step is actually going down to the seabed. It's tougher than space exploration. Outer space is all vacuum. But deep sea has a lot of pressure from the water. It can crush you and your vessel. So preparation is key. In 2021, India took a step in this direction. The government unveiled a new project. It's called Deep Ocean Mission. Some $480 million have been set aside for this project. So that's funding check. Finally, you need an exploration vehicle, a vessel that will take you to the seabed. Let me introduce you to Matse 6000, a self-propelled marine vessel. Matse means fish. The plan is to carry three personnel to a depth of 6,000 meters. It's expected to be launched in 2026. You've heard of Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan. The government calls this Samudrayaan. And what will this mission find on the seabed? Hopefully, some polymetallic nodules do not be put off by the big word. They're basically potato-sized rocks. They're rich in resources like manganese, cobalt, nickel, and copper, what we call rare earth metals. The seabed is littered with these rocks. So India's plan is to go down there, take a sample, bring it back, test it for feasibility, and then begin commercial mining. Now, the financial upside is huge. India says it could have around 380 million tons of polymetallic nodules, our wonder rocks. They're worth almost $110 billion. You can make batteries with them, or EV chargers, or solar farms, or wind farms. Basically, the deep sea could power India's green transition, so it's very important. It's also important politically. You see, the seabed is prime real estate. So there's a race to exploit it. The Americans cannot take part, of, part in this race because they've signed, they've not signed rather, the UN Convention on Rules of the Sea. So the US cannot apply for deep sea licenses. China and Russia have capitalized on this. China has five exploration licenses. Russia has four. So India doesn't want to be left behind. We have two, we've asked for two more. Hence these new applications. It will also help New Delhi project power in the Indian Ocean. Things are already tense there, especially within India-Maldives dispute. So these deep sea missions will help, sort of like marking your territory. We'll have more clarity by the end of this week. Members of the International Seabed Authority are meeting in Jamaica. They will discuss regulations and licenses. Now, I know that deep sea mining must sound wonderful, but it also has some risks. We know very little about this part of the ocean. So mining it before studying it is risky. Many environmental groups oppose deep sea mining. Several countries are also seeking a ban on it, at least a temporary ban, until you can figure out the deep sea's vulnerabilities, how fragile the ecosystem is. And it seems like a fair ask, but tell that to the Chinese. Last year, the ISA actively discussed a deep sea mining ban, and guess who blocked it? China. So yes, we need to, to preserve the deep sea, but we also need to tackle Beijing. We cannot let China draw the rules for the seabed. It's a balance that India will have to strike. Our next story is from Italy, where Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney has declared war, a war on deep fakes. She has filed a lawsuit against two men for manipulating her photos and using them to produce pornographic videos. This happened in 2020. Maloney was not the Prime Minister then, but she was still a senior leader, and the fact that even she was targeted shows that everyone is vulnerable. So this legal battle is very important. It will inspire victims to fight back and set a precedent. Our next report tells you more. When a sitting head of state files a lawsuit, the motive is often political. But Italy's Giorgia Maloney is moving the courts with a different agenda. She fell prey to deep fake pornography a menace that has existed well before the rise of artificial intelligence. But the solutions to the problem are still hard to come by. The case dates back to 2020. The accused are a father and son duo. The cops found them by tracking a mobile. 
the device was used to upload the altered videos. Reports say the clips were available for several months and they were watched millions of times. Maloney is expected to testify in the case in July. She is seeking 100,000 euros in damages. If she wins, Maloney intends to donate these funds. The money will be used to support victims of male violence. Maloney's lawsuit comes at a significant time. The world is debating the need for better guardrails for AI. Europe has moved fast to regulate the new technology. Recently, it passed a new rule book. It tells internet platforms to start identifying AI content better. A new law was also proposed. If passed, it would criminalize deepfake porn. It has taken years for European leaders to catch up. While the world has just started to realize the risks of AI, the menace of deepfake pornography has existed for years. The problem first came to light around 2017. This was when internet platforms started to roll out a new feature. It was called face swapping. It allowed users to blend different faces onto a photograph. The technology was supposed to be fun, but predators deployed it for nefarious means. So far, a number of celebrities have been targeted by deepfakes. Pop star Taylor Swift is among the high-profile victims. Her deepfakes were shared on social media and on digital chat rooms. It took 19 hours to track down the perpetrator, but by then the damage was done. Her deepfakes were viewed more than 27 million times. With the rise of AI, the problem has just become worse. Artificial intelligence can do much more than just clone faces. It can generate fake pictures from scratch. It can imitate voices and alter existing photographs, often without any clear evidence of tampering. AI companies have ruled out some safeguards, mostly to contain misinformation in the political landscape. But these measures are largely symbolic. The existing curbs have failed to stop the flood of political misinformation. When it comes to deepfake porn, victims of abuse remain in most cases defenseless. Maloney's lawsuit only underscores the urgent need for better protections on the internet. In Argentina, it's been 100 days of Javier Millet's presidency. He's, he was elected in November last year and he came with a promise to fix the economy with what he called a shock therapy. And he's faced a lot of backlash for it, a lot of protests. But did the shock therapy work? Looks like it did. Monthly inflation has cooled off. In December, it was 25%. In January, 20.6%. And in February, it was 13%. So the trend looks positive. Inflation is cooling. Argentina's monthly inflation, that is. Millet calls it the result of strong fiscal discipline. The government also boasted of a budget surplus. It's the first in a decade. Even the IMF approves. That's the International Monetary Fund. So some success for President Millet there, but it's not all good. Millet has other problems like annual inflation. We just told you about monthly inflation. This is what the annual inflation looks like. It is at a record 276%, the highest in more than three decades. 57% of the country is living under poverty. There are strikes. People are protesting against the austerity measures. Argentina is going through a humanitarian crisis. I've been saying it for a long time. Once again, we see families and children rummaging through the garbage to try to put something in their bellies. We are not going to sit idle in the face of this reality. When these people explode, they explode. So we're telling the government to pay attention to what is happening and to resolve the situation of hunger that they are creating. When Millet took office, Argentina was already in a bad state. Inflation was at 143%. One in four Argentinians lived in poverty. The currency had lost 90% of its value against the dollar. Millet vowed to change all of that, but warned that the process would be painful. Short-term pain, long-term gain. That was Millet's motto. That's what he said. He described himself as an anarcho-capitalist. His measures were radical. First, he devalued the peso, that's Argentina's national currency. He devalued it by 50%. He slashed 50,000 public jobs. New public work contracts were suspended. Fuel and transport subsidies were all thrown out of the window. The state news agency was shut. 
so was the country's anti-discrimination agency. And funding for scientific research was cut down. The idea was to cut cost. And the IMF welcomed the move. So did international investors. Argentina's international bonds rallied by 7%. That's a reflection of investor confidence. So it started off on a positive note. Millet achieved some early success, but he also faced political hurdles. You see, his party is in the minority. It doesn't have the numbers in Congress. And his rivals do not like his plans. Last week, the Senate rejected a proposal, a decree to change 300 existing standards, like rent caps, regulations on health care, labor laws, privatizing state-owned enterprises, reducing maternity leave pay. So this was a radical austerity plan, and it met with opposition. People took to the streets in protest. The courts called it unconstitutional. Lawmakers did not support it, and Argentina's Senate then struck it down. It's a setback for the president. And he's said to be working on another strategy, firming up his numbers, waiting for the midterm elections. They'll be held next year, in 2025. If, he does, if his party does well in those elections, he may get the bill through. And while his policies are delivering for now, they do have their own set of problems. Like I said, more than half of Argentina's population is, is living in, in poverty. Food prices are soaring. People cannot afford food. So when the government cuts food aid, these people suffer. Some of them are scavenging to survive. When we take the rubbish bins out, there are at least 20 people who approach us. They are looking for something to take home. This is a very tough and a sad situation. Critics believe Millet's policies could lead to mass unemployment, something that would wreck the economy. But Millet is convinced about his plan. He says it will get way worse before it gets better. Either way, Argentina is looking at a turbulent future. Our next story is from Senegal. It's a country in West Africa. It's a former French colony. And when you hear that, former French colony, you expect instability, poverty, and military rule, the hallmarks of French influence in the region. But Senegal is different. It's the only country in the region that has remained coup-free, and it has survived an attempt to undo this stability. The outgoing president, Macky Sall, tried to postpone the election. He locked up the opposition. He wanted to extend his rule beyond his mandate, but Senegal's courts struck the plan down. And now the country is going to polls on Sunday. Here's our report. Senegal is holding its presidential election on Sunday. After a month's delay and a potential political crisis, the people of Senegal will get to choose their next leader. It was by no means certain that this would happen. The incumbent president, Macky Sall, nearly upended the democratic process. He's about to finish his second term. He's supposed to leave office by the 2nd of April at the latest. But instead of accepting this, Sal tried to extend his mandate. Last month, he postponed the elections. They were scheduled for February 25th. But just days before they took place, Sal said they were deferred. He said he would hold them on December 15th. Meaning, he illegitimately tried to extend his rule by 10 months. The people of Senegal were furious. They took to the streets. They clashed with the authorities and put Sal under tremendous pressure. Eventually, the courts were called to action and they ruled that Sal's postponement order was illegal. They directed him to hold the election as soon as possible. And so, he settled on March 24th, this Sunday. Not only did the people of Senegal prevent Sal from exceeding his mandate, they also succeeded in getting justice for jailed opposition leaders. Sal put forth an amnesty bill, paving the way for the release of his jailed opponents. Of these opponents, none is more of a threat to him than Usman Sonko. We continue to be demanding towards those who organize the election. That is why I say, President is responsible. His departure will not be easy. If he wants to render one last service to his country before leaving, he should ensure that these elections go smoothly and are transparent. Sonko has a massive following among Senegal's youth. And this is a young country, with about 60% of the population being under the age of 25. This makes Sonko the country's foremost opposition figure. He's also not your conventional politician. Sonko is considered anti-establishment, a pan-Africanist, and a leader with unconventional policies. 
For example, Sonko wants to bring in a new currency. Senegal, like other former French colonies, uses the West African CFA franc. Sonko wants to do away with it. He wants a new currency in Senegal to break the colonial hangover and remove undue French influence. Sonko also promises to create jobs and boost economic growth. So he's promising Senegal's people self-respect and growth. You can see why he's the biggest threat to the status quo. But he won't be standing for the post of president. He's been barred because of a defamation conviction. And he had been imprisoned in another case. So instead, Sonko has set up a proxy. Basiru Diomaye Faye. Sonko wants his massive supporter base to vote for this man. So don't be surprised if Faye becomes the country's next president. As for Sal, his two terms are up. His antics have alienated many in Senegal. So his chosen successor, former Prime Minister Amadou Ba, may have an uphill battle ahead. But even if Ba succeeds, the real winners are the people of Senegal. They prevented an unlawful extension of power. They forced the government to keep democracy intact. And it is they who have ensured that Senegal remains an oasis of stability in an otherwise unstable region. Captain Cool has struck again. I'm talking about MS Dhoni, former captain of the Indian cricket team and now the former captain of Chennai Super Kings. That's right. Dhoni will not be captaining CSK anymore. The announcement was made this evening, that too on the eve of CSK's first match of the IPL. Many would say classic Dhoni. He did the same with his test captaincy as well. In 2014, India was playing a five-match series in Australia after the fourth test. Dhoni decided to retire. No warning, no indications, just a sudden announcement. He's done the same in Chennai Super Kings, by the way. The club has already named his replacement. It's Rituraj Gaikwad, a batsman from Maharashtra. Now, this transition was sort of inevitable. Dhoni is 42 years old. He played the last season with an injury. So he had to give up the captaincy at some point. After all, clubs have to plan their future. Yet fans on social media are heartbroken. And it's understandable why. Dhoni and CSK had become synonymous. He's captained the club since the first season in 2008, and his record is very impressive. The CSK has played 249 games in the IPL and the Champions League. Dhoni has captained 235 of them, and he's made 10 IPL finals, won the IPL trophy five times, and won the Champions League twice. Simply put, he's the most successful IPL captain. He tried once to let go of the captaincy. This was in 2022. Ravinder Jadeja took over from him. But that season was a nightmare for CSK, so bad that Jadeja stepped down after eight matches. So once again, Dhoni was called in. And the next season, he won the title for CSK. This time, though, it looks like a done deal. At 42, we don't know how much longer Dhoni can play. The speculation is that he could retire after 2024. So that's the end of an illustrious chapter in the IPL. But let's focus a bit on Dhoni. Not Dhoni the player, because enough has been said and written about him. Let's focus on Dhoni the brand. He's built a very specific image of himself. You won't see him a lot in public. You won't see him tweeting nonstop. Yet he's always part of the conversation. Whether through brand deals or on-field plays or advertisements, Dhoni's brand is built on detachment, you could say. Just look at his social media. He had two Instagram posts in 2023, zero in 2022, and one in 2021. You don't expect that from a public figure, especially not an Indian cricketer. It's the same story on Twitter or X. Dhoni's last tweet was way back in 2021. And this tells a story. We live in an era where celebrities are everywhere. You open Instagram and they're going to the gym. You open X, they're at the airport. So it's hard to ignore them. But Dhoni does the opposite. He rarely reveals his life and hobbies on social media, whether by design or not. It's low-key. Like when he retired from international cricket in 2020. No big farewell of, or event. Dhoni just dropped a message on social media and listen to what he said. I'm quoting. Thanks a lot for your love and support throughout. From 1929 hours, consider me as retired. <laughs> Talk about underwhelming. 
especially for India's most successful captain, most successful cricket captain. But that's Brand Dhoni for you. The fans know only what he wants them to know, like his massive bike collection or his love for the army. It's a strategy that has worked for him. Of course, that doesn't mean every celebrity should turn on airplane mode. Some like to remain active. Others like to fly below the radar. But if you play it right, both can work. What would you do if you could move things with your brain? Save the world, become a superhero, or just get a glass of water without getting up? Well, that day is not far away. Today, Neuralink released a new video. It shows a paralyzed man playing online chess. How is he controlling the cursor? With his brain. He got one of Neuralink's brain chips this January. It is a brain chip company led by Elon Musk, Neuralink. And the core idea is quite impressive. Sending neuroelectrical activity to anything digital. It can be life-changing. You can then control almost anything from prosthetic arms to your Tesla cars. Imagine the power your thoughts would have. But there are many hurdles in the way. Our next report tells you if Musk's brain technology can indeed change the world. Um, Noland Arbor looked intently at his screen. He was playing a game of chess online. His brows furrowed. Soon, the cursor moved. Um, um, the only way Arbor made his move. But here's the catch. Arbor once had a diving accident and he's paralyzed below his shoulders. So he didn't use his hands to move the cursor. He did it with his brain. It's like mind control. But Arbor isn't a Jedi. He was just using a brain chip. It was made by Elon Musk's company, Neuralink. The device is about the size of five coins stacked together. It's inserted into the skull. Then the hardware will harbor electrodes. This will record neural activity and stimulate specific regions of the brain. What happens then? Well, you may be able to use your thoughts to control the world. Arbor was given the chip in January. He says the surgery was easy. Since then, he's tested it out many times. Once, he even played a video game for eight hours with the chip. Of course, Arbor says the technology is not perfect. There are some problems and minor glitches, but most of the time, it works. Wireless brain chips are not new. By the 2000s, monkeys were being trained on it. They were doing the same thing moving cursors with their brains. But since then, the technology hasn't evolved much. Neuralink wants to refine that. The company aims to connect human brains to computers. That way, it can tackle neurological conditions. The idea is to supercharge human capabilities. Basically, control your devices with thoughts. Also, treat neurological disorders like Parkinson's. Of course, it all sounds like a science fiction movie. But for once, Elon Musk is behind the curve. Other such startups are already in the race. One company is called Synchron. It's backed by Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. It has implanted its device in 10 patients. Researchers in Switzerland have also achieved miracles. They helped a paralyzed man walk. This was by implanting multiple devices. But for Musk, solving neurological conditions is only the first step. He wants to build a symbiotic relationship between humans and AI. Cyborg alert. Imagine searching the internet with your brain or ordering food with just your thoughts. The possibilities are immense and that's what Musk aims to explore. But many people remain skeptical. Scientists believe there are enormous barriers. First, practicality. Would you cut open your brain just to search the web with your thoughts? Second, adaptability. Everyone's brain is different, so it can't be a one-size-fits-all approach. And third, injuries. Many fear it could damage the blood vessels in the brain. So, while Neuralink is an ambitious venture, there are a lot of hurdles. This is where the line between science fiction and reality blurs. And while Musk may tout it, there's a long way to go before your thoughts can move the world. Yeah, so we started out with a... 
What do you expect from the leader of a nation? Good communication skills, clarity and conviction in policy making, commitment to public good. How about bulging muscles? We ask because this burning question has taken over the internet thanks to Emmanuel Macron, the president of France. His official photographer posted two images on Instagram. These are photos of Macron working out, hitting a punch bag with clenched teeth and drawn features. As you can tell, the main attraction here is not Emmanuel Macron, it's his muscles. Obviously, the images have gone viral. The word Rocky, inspired by the blockbuster boxing movie, is trending on social media. These pictures are being seen as a show of Macron's physical strength, of his virility. But the praise is coming hand in hand, or should I say bicep in bicep, with consternation and criticism. After the infamous Kate Gate, and the hunt for doctored photos of the British royal family, amateur sleuths are on high alert for image tweaking. Many of them say Macron's pictures have been enhanced. And they point to the size of Macron's biceps, reposting them alongside images of his thin arms. Meanwhile, opposition leaders are up in arms. They're calling this a PR campaign, a quote-unquote poverty of political communication. And some netizens are mocking Macron. Demanding yoga pictures of Olaf Scholz next. That's the Chancellor of Germany. But mockery aside, these images are hitting hard. And there are two big questions here. Why these pictures and why now? The obvious answer is this. Macron is shifting from a so-called, being a so-called dove to a hawk and changing his stance over the war in Ukraine. Less than a week ago, he flexed his muscle on Ukraine. He refused to rule out sending troops to Kiev. He called on Euro Europe to ramp up its response against Russia. And all of this may have been just rhetoric, but it all points to one direction. These recent words and pictures form a potent combination of narrative building, an imagery that will not be lost on Russia. In fact, these photos may be an indirect message of Macron getting ready to take on Putin, the Russian president, who, by the way, is no stranger to such photo shoots himself. Putin has shown off his sporting prowess, his physical strength repeatedly. He's gone bare-chested on a horse, played ice hockey, defeated his opponents at judo, hung out on tanks and submarines. So if this is a competition among so-called strongmen, a few photos may not cut it for Macron. Putin is already the master of this genre. Even so, Macron is buffing up his image. And he's not the only one to have tried this. Nicolas Sarkozy was often shown jogging or cycling. Rishi Sunak is set to work out every morning. Barack Obama was shown playing basketball and baseball. Justin Trudeau went viral for boxing in 2012. But fair warning here, politics and sports do not always play out well. And no one knows this better than the British red card, Boris Johnson. In 2015, he was left red-faced. He was playing rugby during a visit to Tokyo and he flattened a 10-year-old boy, making news for all the wrong reasons. But despite the mishaps and the mockery, political leaders refuse to throw in the towel. They know that creating a strongman image could help their case. Maybe that's exactly what Macron is trying to do here, now that it is his turn to take on Putin. Ironically, Macron is taking a leaf out of his adversary's book. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Brussels, protesters try to stop world leaders from reaching nuclear energy summit. In New York, a man seeks return, the return of his beloved pet alligator, Albert. And Peru repatriates 4,600 archaeological artifacts from America to Europe and Europe. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1935. Persia was renamed as Iran. The new name was derived from the Persian word Iran, which means land of Aryans. It was adopted by Iran Shah to connect with the nation's ancient past. We are leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
Il est rentré avec ton écran, non Ah, c'est le matériel ici. Security, mais raison,